Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and also an occasional host. This week, I first get to bring you a conversation with Sarah Estelle, a professor of economics at Hope College. Sarah has started a new blog series on Friedrich A. Hayek for Acton's blog to mark the 75th anniversary of the publishing of his book, The Road to Serfdom. And I thought it was a great opportunity to talk about Hayek's life and work for the podcast. After that, I speak with Tyler O'Neill, a senior editor at PJ Media, about the new movie Unplanned, shedding light on the realities of abortion. If you want to read any articles mentioned in this episode, you can find them all linked in our show notes, posted every Wednesday at blog.acton.org. Lastly, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast at acton.org slash line. That's A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G slash line. Today, I get to sit down with Sarah Estelle, a friend of Acton and of mine, and a professor of economics at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. She's practically a regular on the podcast now, having joined us for several other conversations before, which I will link in our show notes. Sarah, thank you for joining me again. Thanks for inviting me. We're here to talk about a new article series on Friedrich A. Hayek that you've started on Acton's blog. It's been 75 years since The Road to Serfdom by F.A. Hayek was published, and it's popular today, and even when it was published, it was a huge hit. I read that when it was first printed, it flew off the shelves so quickly that it was hard to get your hands on it until it was released for a wider audience in a condensed version by the Reader's Digest in 1945. So first, I want to ask you, who is F.A. Hayek? Hayek uh, was an economist born in Vienna at the uh, time that he kind of came of age between World War I and World War II. Intellectuals in, in Vienna uh, had a very rich life of, of the mind, uh, interdisciplinary. I think we see that, I should say, uh, in his work throughout his life. But economists also, pretty dissimilar from today, weren't always in the academic setting. There's a bit of a preference among economists today to, to have kind of the academic connection, but that wasn't really an option for many of these economists, uh, at least in, in Vienna. But he was interested um, in economics and writing and sharing those ideas. Uh, he did so initially in Vienna, but then moved on to the London School of Economics. Very shortly thereafter, he wrote uh, the memo that started their road to to serfdom. Uh, I mean, this was relatively early in his career, and it wasn't meant to be some, you know, magnum opus or anything like that. It was meant to be a particular response to a, a colleague. Uh, and it resulted in this book that, as you've mentioned, has been very popular. How often does an economics book get picked up by Reader's Digest? Yeah, no kidding. Well, I, I've also heard that he said that upon writing it, he unexpectedly created 30 years of work for himself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think it's beautiful uh, that in the definitive edition that's available in the Acton uh, bookshop, um, there are so many forewords and prefaces uh, that allow us to kind of track his thinking on what this book means at different points in time and how he's reflecting on it. I found that a, a rich source of information. So I'm I'm glad, at least, that he's uh, he had that work created for him. Can you give us a brief overview? What are the main objectives to The Road to Serfdom? What are the motives of his writing it? And maybe along with that, can you describe some of the context in which he wrote it? Sure. Uh, maybe I'll start with the context, because I think that does allow us to understand uh, what his his motives were. Context is 1944, and specifically his audience or the audience he had in mind uh, were people in Great Britain. Uh, and he's thinking right close to the end of World War II, thinking about things kind of dwindling down in that way and and kind of how are people thinking about uh, the role of the state and especially central planning? Uh, how are they looking at Nazism kind of with a, a unified front of knowing that there's something extraordinarily wrong there and being united in that, but seeing it as the result of something like uh, capitalism gone awry or an extreme form of capitalism rather than he would argue right? Socialism. And, and seeing that a, a large kind of military response has, I think he would say, appropriately been built up against that, but that if we don't take a step back, 
um, and at that time look at the liberal heritage of uh, Great Britain and also the United States, and by liberal, of course, I mean something along the lines of classical liberal, um, that that approach to planning that's necessary in war times uh, would lead us potentially down this road to serfdom or totalitarianism, even in the West that and the portions of the West that have this strong liberal heritage. So I think his objective was to learn from history and to share that learning, and in particular in a way that uh, bred respect for that that liberal heritage. Um, one thing that I appreciate about his book is, is that he had to bear some serious costs for putting himself out there, professional costs, I would imagine also personal costs, because it wasn't a popular argument uh, to make, although it ended up being a popular book. Can you explain in what way was it not popular to make that argument? Yeah, well, I think it's not popular among academics to dwell on the limitations of your academic discipline or on what you might contribute to a country. Um, so he argues in uh, some of the front matter to the book that actually he could have had a much more fruitful career in one sense had he uh, been a proponent of socialism because he would have been one of the central planners, someone uh, with that kind of technical acumen that he had um, really would have been uh, a big player uh, and that his colleagues had argued that with him, that actually you would be better off if you would uh, go in the other direction. He also had to take time away from what he considered to be more technical economics work uh, to write this book. And he says, um, he writes that he actually feels better qualified for so many other things. But it's clear that he's expressing uh, in the intro to the book that that he feels convicted to write this book, uh, despite the fact that it's not going to be politically uh, popular for him and is going to put him a bit on the outs uh, in his in his discipline. And I think we see that throughout his work, uh, frankly. One example is that he's, he's a great admirer of uh, traditional morality and um, religion. Uh, and he actually faced backlash for that in, in terms of his job prospects. Um, that's why some would argue that he didn't end up in the economics department at the University of Chicago, but rather an interdisciplinary social science group. I admire him for this, right, that that he paid costs uh, to do things he felt convicted about. What would you say are some misconceptions about either who he is as a person, his life, or his work, especially the road to serfdom? I think there are a lot of people from different perspectives, and in particular, even those who might like Hayek or who they think he is, uh, or what he's written, uh, those who don't care for him particularly, that we might uh, make a caricature of him. Sometimes that's simply because we haven't read him or read him deeply or read him recently enough. And so I, I, I worry a, a bit about that when people reference him, right, that we don't uh, necessarily know exactly what he says. I think sometimes the, the road to serfdom, that language gets people thinking that he's going to argue, here's where we're going. We're on the slippery slope and there's no turning back. So some might make a caricature of him by saying he's a determinist, which he uh, refutes um, and argues the opposite, actually. Why would, he, why would I write this book if I thought there was no, uh, no chance or no hope? In fact, I want you to understand what's going on here so that we might um, avoid totalitarianism. Um, he also doesn't argue that every little bit of government intervention is that first step on that slippery slope. Um, he, in fact, says in The Road to Serfdom uh, that, uh, quote, laissez-faire is a highly ambiguous and misleading description of the principles of which a liberal polity is based. And so he's not claiming that term even laissez-faire, even though I think that's a strong piece of the liberal tradition. He doesn't care for it. He's a real stickler for language. Uh, he thinks this notion of let it be, right, let things be that laissez-faire communicates is not right because the state plays an important role in terms of providing the rule of law, property rights. He even goes a bit further, and I think this is where 
those who might refer to themselves as Hayekians uh, <laughs> sometimes are a bit more um, extreme mm-hmm. uh, in their thinking than than he is. He's he says in in various writings that that a, a wealthy society should be able to provide. Ba- the, for the basic needs of everyone. Uh, now, sometimes he doesn't get so specific about what that means, but in some places, it very much sounds like a universal basic income, which most people who hold strongly to the label classical liberal today would be not supporting a universal basic income system. Um, social insurance and the like is something that he sees as a state rule. So it's even more than just the rule of law. Uh, and so I think he's a much more nuanced thinker, less extreme than some of us who uh, would claim affinity for him, less extreme than those who perhaps don't care for him. So something I've been thinking about, you know, I've, I've complained about this before, and I've heard other people complain about this too, that some talking points and some people are brought up so repeatedly in conversation in conservative bubbles that it can get a little tired and it can seem like we're hitting these talking points in these people. And I also want to make sure that when we bring them up in conversation that we're doing it in a helpful way and that we understand what we're talking about too, that we're not just throwing them in conversation. But do you think that he is perhaps over-referenced or referenced unhelpfully? That's a great question. I think th- the latter. I think maybe he's referenced to the extent that he's over referenced. It's in an un, only because it's in an unhelpful way, right? We could do a we could do a better job getting at some of that nuance, and I think that starts with actually reading him. And he's not always an easy read. Uh, again, he's very careful with language. He's not painting with broad strokes. Uh, He's quite precise. Uh, I use my dictionary frequently (laughs) when I read him because I think it's he really means those words in a particular way. And I want to make sure that I'm not just understanding it in context, that I really understand the the real particularity of the word that he's he's chosen. Uh, And so sometimes people will throw around his image, but not really get at at the root of what he's trying to do. I think sometimes we even will reference some of his conclusions. We know he's not a fan of central planning, right? Maybe that's an understatement. Um, And we then say that was the sum total of his career and his writings. That's what it was all about. Or maybe we know that he had debates with um, uh, in his work, right? And in personal letters with with John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and so, we, again, we make a caricature of him. Here are the th- couple things that he did. But his work is so rich, and there's so much to unpack there. Uh, and it's very academic. Uh, it's not just his opinions. It's certainly not, here's an opinion, and how do I make an argument to get there? He has integrity. And I think we should strive to read him well enough to reflect that integrity. What would you say are the most important points that Hayek makes in The Road to Serfdom, especially for the times that we live in today? So if you could see my annotated copy (laughs) of The Road to Serfdom, you would know that I think there are about 500 very prescient things uh, there. Or um, if you looked at my Facebook page, I'm... um, want to, I don't know, quote him about every other day. Uh, So there's quite a bit there. And it's one of the reasons that I wanted to write this blog, actually, was to dig a little bit deeper uh, and be able to share some of these with a a larger audience. audience than my my Facebook friends. Uh, and so I don't know that this is like a, a top 10 list or anything like that. But, but some of the things I've been thinking about are how carefully and explicitly he argues that central planning happens on both the right and the left. And I think that's important for us to remember. I think this goes back to your previous question about how we could potentially use Hayek as a as a mallet. We don't want to just see Hayek as a fight against the progressive left, right? That he actually has lessons for all of us and reminders for, for everyone. Um, he Uh, talks about, of course, free trade, but he also has a lot to say about social justice and maybe even something along the lines of identity, which we hear a lot about in our kind of um, 
you know, kind of public discourse. Uh, and so I think there there's relevance there. Certainly, he talks a lot about socialism, and, and clearly that's one of the main points of the road to serfdom. But he talks about types of socialism, and he gets into an actual argument, right, and laying out the logic of how these things happen, right? He has a chapter in the road to serfdom, how the worst get on top, right? And, and so there's much more to the argument. And I think as... Listeners um, who maybe haven't read the book or haven't read it recently go through it again. They they might find that the book could have just as easily been written last week as it was in in 1944. Some of the language is a little bit older, uh, but I actually think that adds to the the quality of the argument. You're teaching a course at Acton University this summer titled Why Hayek Should Matter to Christians. And I don't want to spoil the content of it, of course, for our listeners who are planning on going to it. But can you give us a broad idea of what you mean by that? Why does Hayek matter to Christians? Was Hayek himself a Christian? Hayek actually was an avowed agnostic in all of his writing. Now, there is some discussion. In fact, I talked to Father Sirico about this a, a few months ago, some discussion of uh, where he was personally at the, the time of his death. So um, I have great hopes. Um, I hope that I'll be able to ask him some burning questions I have from him at a later date. Um, but I, no, in his writing, he, he would claim to be agnostic. And I it's interesting because he is such an admirer of the role of religion in the formation uh, and sustainability of our our civilization. But I actually think think it makes him even a a bit more interesting to study from a Christian perspective because he's not saying things with uh, right an idea that. Th- he doesn't believe in revelation, for example, which I think we're very fortunate, right, obviously, to have revelation to draw on. Uh, but he's but he's really just observing the world around him. And he finds things that, to me, just resonate with an orthodox view of of the created order, right, with a, an understanding that there is a designer, although he personally would say there isn't a design and therefore isn't a designer. Uh, but the sorts of things he notices uh, dovetail so well with traditional or orthodox kind of Christian theology. So the fact that he is an agnostic to me just makes it more interesting how much he has to offer um, believers Um, A couple of the contributions that he makes in his work, I think, are particularly applicable uh, for Christian believers or just people who want to live in community in an effective sort of way. Uh, So one of his main contributions is an understanding of what he calls local knowledge, uh, that the sorts of information we need in order to make good decisions, sound decisions, um, is dispersed. It's essentially dispersed, he says. There's no way to communicate it in a way that one person or a group of individuals can have all of it at, at their availability. And, and so it's particular to time and place. And therefore, we need a system that makes the best use of that dispersed knowledge. Uh, I think that has huge implications for, for example, how we engage with those who are experiencing material poverty. Where is it that we can be effectively altruistic? He would argue at the local level, within families, within small neighborhoods, within what he says can rightly be referred to as a society, right, where there's uh, fraternity and knowledge uh, that allows us to act effectively in that space. Uh, Globally, on the larger scale, or what he would call the extended order, we don't have the same kind of knowledge that we would need to act with altruism. In fact, this is one of, if not the main way that he argues uh, that the market system is the, the best way to sound economic decisions. He says it's because prices that result from market interactions allow us to act as if we have all sorts of knowledge that we really just can't have. So why should Christians care about this? These day in, day out understandings of, you know, how to how to work and walk alongside the poor, uh, how to operate in our uh, congregations, I think how to be good stewards of scarce resources. Uh, but then some of these larger 
more social political issues. What is it that's so special about markets? What is the appropriate role of the state if we care about human flourishing? Um, but that's all not to the exclusion either of his observations that families operate differently and should. Uh, so he tells us that we need to learn uh, to live in two sorts of worlds. And I think this puts him in a position to be particularly relevant uh, to those of us who believe that we are created as individuals, but also social at the same time. You're obviously very personally passionate about Hayek, interested in his work. Why is that? When did you first pick him up and read him? And what is it about him that has kept you so interested in what he does? So I'm sure that the first time I read him would have been 20 something years ago uh, when I was in college uh, at Hillsdale College as an econ major. I just cannot believe that I would not have read some Hayek at the time. Um, but I've really rediscovered him since graduate school. You know, honestly, one of the things I like about him best is he's such a straight shooter. Uh, I just love his conviction and the way he writes so carefully using language uh, with precision. So here's an example of both the straight shooter and precise language. He has a chapter in uh, his final book, The Fatal Conceit, where uh, he talks about social, the word social being a, quote, weasel word. I mean, right? He's not uh, kind of holding anything back. It's a weasel word. Uh, and he doesn't, right? He's not just, uh, you know, throwing flaming arrows at people he disagrees with. He's got an argument for this. He says, let's look at the etymology of this word. What does it really mean? Okay, it goes back to, wow, you actually have to know people within a society. Originally, a society was people who knew each other, probably shared some objectives. There was a closeness. There was a real community notion. But today we use the word social really to append anything else that we think is good and to use it kind of as an argument that if it's good, then we need to all do it together. It's got to be this big effort. And so I just love that Hayek um, doesn't mince words uh, and is very very careful in that. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I think his integrity is is notable. He's he's he bore some costs uh, to stepping out and saying what he believes to be true. And I think the final thing I'd say, which is ultimately what leaves me thinking this could be a major piece of my scholarship for the remainder of my career, is his work is so rich, not obviously you know, and not intentionally aligned with, with Christian thinking. His goal is, is not to undergird any kind of traditional theological argument, but I think in a lot of ways it actually does. I think there's a lot left to be unpacked there. And I, I just find it personally so rewarding in my scholarship when things come together, where there's synthesis, where there's Again, this dovetailing of things. To me, it all points to, regardless of what the objective is, if it points in the same direction, if all truth is God's truth, uh, then when Hayek is accurate in his keen observations, he's telling us something about God. He's telling us something about the created order. And where it matches up with traditional theology, they just, they, they're richer together than they are apart. Well, I really don't think that we could end on a better note. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Caroline. In the face of fiscal irresponsibility, soaring deficits, sweeping new healthcare regulations, and an uncontrollable national debt, the Acton Institute offers a fresh and unique perspective. For over 29 years, the Institute has worked to connect economic freedom, free enterprise, and entrepreneurship with a vibrant Judeo-Christian moral culture. Please join Rev. Robert Sirico, co-founder and president of Acton Institute and other supporters and friends of Acton, on Wednesday, May 1st at the Detroit Athletic Club for a luncheon and a special keynote address on the moral and practical problems with resurgent socialism, given by Rev. Sirico. To save your spot at this event or become an official sponsor of our Detroit luncheon, register now at acton.org slash events. Released in theaters across the country on March 29, the film Unplanned is about Abby Johnson, a woman who worked at a Planned Parenthood clinic in Texas. 
During her eight years there, she rose in leadership to become the youngest clinic director in Planned Parenthood's history. But after seeing an ultrasound-guided DNC abortion, also known as a suction DNC, Abby was convicted by what she had seen, as the baby was shown twisting on the ultrasound monitor. After that, she resigned from Planned Parenthood and is now working to help other abortion clinic workers get out of the industry. Here to talk with me a bit more about the subject is Tyler O'Neill, a senior editor at PJ Media. Tyler, thank you for joining the show. My pleasure. Since the film has been released, it's been interesting to watch the audience response. You know, although it's a small, cheaply, independently produced film, it's done pretty well, placing fifth in the opening weekend box office and boasting the highest per screen average of any indie film debut in U.S. history. What's even more interesting to watch from the sidelines is how the media has responded to the film and rumors about Twitter suspending the film's account are circulating. So before we dive into that, though, I'll start by asking, what did you think of the movie? What were your initial thoughts? Yeah, I was very moved. I think the film is uh, equal parts terrifying and inspiring. Uh, We had the story of Abby Johnson, and throughout it seemed uh, it was a very compelling story. Uh, She was approached in college to work with Planned Parenthood. Her parents were pro-life, but they... uh, talked her into it. The Planned Parenthood people talked her into it. And she rose in the ranks and she had two abortions herself. And actually one of the really moving and and terrifying parts of the film is when she herself undergoes an abortion. And it's just an abortion pill. And she goes home and she's in the bathroom for hours. There's a lot of blood coming down her leg. She's writhing in pain and You know, there was a big controversy that the film received an R rating. Uh, I think the rating might be a little overstated, but the fact that the suffering and the death of these unborn babies is painful and tragic enough to merit an R rating is a testament to the humanity of uh, those in the womb who get killed in this horrific way. I agree with that. Well, do you think that by the rating, do you think that they were trying to discourage an audience attendance? That, that's actually a very a very good and interesting question. I believe the, uh, the original unplanned response to the rating was complaints that the MPAA was trying to push people away. But the interesting thing about R ratings is that a lot of movies shoot for them. They try to get R ratings uh, because then they're seen as edgy enough and interesting enough for the teenagers to go see them on their own court. And so I think the R rating actually helped Unplanned quite a bit uh, because it drew more attention and controversy and it it pushed the movie up to the forefront of Americans' imaginations, especially after all the horrific abortion news we've been having recently from liberals trying to uh, make sure that if Roe v. Wade is overturned, the abortion laws will still be just as radical as they really are under Roe v. Wade. Well, one of the things that I appreciated about the movie is that it didn't demonize the clinic workers and it didn't make the pro-life campaigners outside of the clinic look like saviors either. It treated people pretty fairly and it wasn't trying to make huge, you know, political statements, but it was trying to show that these people who work at the clinic and especially Abby Johnson, they really do have good intentions. And a lot of these talking points that Planned Parenthood puts out is really about helping women. And it's about, they say, women's rights. I mean, framed even larger in, I would say, the pro-life movement is the advocacy for human rights. And I think when it gets down to it, it just kind of reveals how much of a confusion there is over what defines a right in our present public discourse. Yes, very much so. And I think one of the one of the problems is that you have people who seem to think that we have the right to uh well to sexual lasciviousness without the natural consequences of that. This is a problem that you know, we we don't want conservatives are often portrayed as wanting to control people's private lives. We don't conservatives support the availability of birth control, but most importantly, we support life. And when life starts in the womb, from the moment of conception, 
that is genetically a separate human being. And so hopefully we can get to the point, I mean, I've seen some advancements where human beings might be able to grow in an artificial womb uh, that might be able to solve a lot of the abortion problems if it were able to be done um, rightly and not with any harm to the to the child. Uh, but we we just can't ignore the life and the inherent dignity of these human beings. Now, you wrote an article for PJ Media shortly after the release of the film, and you titled it The Pro-Life Movie, Unplanned Mysteriously Loses 99,000 Twitter Followers Despite Box Office Win. You write that, quote, the movie's Twitter account was briefly suspended on Saturday, mere hours after its release on Friday. On Sunday, the account seems to have mysteriously lost 99,000 of its 100,000 followers. But that's not the whole story, is it? Because it seems that the water has been muddied a little bit even more (laughs) since that article was written. Can you explain some of the events surrounding that? Yeah. So uh, what we have, I mean, you just covered very well the uh, basic events of what happened over the weekend. But Judd Legum, who's founder of Think Progress, suggested that Unplanned had used a quote-unquote obvious scam in pushing the movie, saying that when on Sunday followers could no longer follow the movie, that Unplanned had done a soft block, which means that it blocks all of its followers and then it unblocks them. And that actually would explain the experience that I had because I was following Unplanned. Suddenly, I was no longer following Unplanned. I went to Twitter, I pushed the follow button on Unplanned. When I refreshed the page, I wasn't following it anymore. So Twitter was forcing us to not follow it. But I spoke with uh, the producer, one of the producers for Unplanned, Joe Knopp, and he explained to me that, uh, that both of these events were one and the same, that when Twitter blocked Unplanned because of its algorithm, it says, the account had to disappear for a brief period of time and then it came back and then it had to essentially refresh and that meant it would lose all its followers and then gain them back again. The interesting thing about all that was that it has more followers, three times more followers now than it did before the block and it now has more followers than Planned Parenthood itself, which is an interesting commentary on uh, the movement. But he said that you know, this was not something they they orchestrated. And I think I believe him partially because when he told me the way that Unplanned went about pushing, you know, getting the movie out there, they didn't they didn't follow the same sort of scientific method, if you will. They had to work with word of mouth and work with pro life activists on the ground to get the message out there. So there are pro life organizations that hosted uh screenings of Unplanned on the uh, on the opening weekend. And they were using Twitter to connect with different groups on social media and coordinate that. So any sort of loss on Twitter, any sort of uh, loss of followers, any, anything like what happened would have weakened their ability to do what they were trying to do. Maybe, <laughs> you know, th- there's always the question, when something like this happens, did somebody try to make it, make themselves get banned because it did give them publicity, but it doesn't stand to reason that they orchestrated this at all. So I'd like to talk about this in a bigger context of free speech and censorship, because I don't think it's news to anyone that Twitter and various other social media outlets and publications who claim to be open-minded You know, some don't hesitate to ban speech or let people go who don't hold the same ideological points of view. In 2018, a blogger representing Twitter wrote, quote, we do not shadow ban. You are always able to see the tweets from other accounts you follow. And we certainly don't shadow ban based on political viewpoints or ideology. You know, we can talk all day about different instances of blocking or banning that Twitter has done, I would say, under those same exact circumstances that she claims that it's not. But Assuming that Twitter did shadow ban unplanned for a short period of time, do you believe this is technically censorship? Is that how you would define it? And if not, what do you think defines censorship? 
Oh, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, for me, I see it as censorship. I refer to social media censorship, but I understand the arguments. Um, there's an organization out here in D.C. Uh, called the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and I very much appreciate their work and think they're uh, they're doing good things out here. And they argue consistently that social media. Uh, they call it filtering instead of censorship. It's it's an interesting question because back in the 90s, Congress decided to give these companies uh, leeway with uh, the Good Samaritan provision of the Communications Act. And uh, what what this does is it means that companies like Twitter, Facebook, they're not li- held liable for the speech that's posted on their platforms. And... I think in general, that's a good thing. But the problem is that if they're not considered publishers, if they're not held liable for what they're, what they're allowing on their platforms, what happens when they decide to censor and, you know, when they decide to take down somebody's messages or ban their accounts? So, like, I don't know what happened with the unplanned situation, but I do know that uh, feminist journalist Megan Murphy was suspended and kicked off of Twitter because she disagreed with the transgender identity of this activist who, you know, he, he wasn't even clear in showing that he was entirely committed to being a quote unquote transgender woman. She referred to him as a man because biologically he's a man and Twitter banned her. And of course it's interesting because Twitter doesn't just ban everybody who quote unquote misgenders someone on their platform. They only banned her because she's on the left. And when you have liberals who disagree with the transgender phenomenon and this ideology, they're particularly noxious to these activists because they show that it's not just us bigoted conservatives who disagree. But there are, there are other examples. Iran refugee Ramin Parsa was also censored on Twitter and he was uh, arrested at the Mall of America for sharing his faith with Somali Muslims. He himself is a former Muslim from Iran. And there, there are a lot of these examples where Twitter will also temporarily ban a conservative uh, for posting something. And then they will lift the ban, but force that person to delete the message. So there's a big movement right now on the right where a lot of conservative and Christian organizations are saying, we need to take away the privileged immunity that social media companies have. If they're going to be removing the speech of their users, then they need to be held accountable for what they're publishing. And it's a, it's a fair argument. There, there are different ways that it could have negative effects on the way social media works if that policy comes into effect. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, Clearly, something has to happen. Well, you know, it seems like to me sometimes, regardless of how much, you know, shadow banning, whatever terminology you want to use, these social media platforms are doing. I mean, in your opinion, is it changing people's opinions? Because it, it, I mean, obviously the turnout of the movie seemed to me people aren't following social media to make their opinions for them. They're independent thinkers. But practically, how do you see it affecting our dialogue? Yeah, no. So I think that when it comes to the filtering or censorship on social media, it probably has an impact on the margins. If shadow banning is a real thing, and of course, I don't know how, to what extent it happens, but I think it's quite possible that it happens. I mean, after all, whenever I'm on Twitter, I don't know if I see exactly every tweet from every account that I'm following. It's possible I do. I hope that Twitter doesn't shadow ban. But if it does, then it would stifle debate and make some positions less visible to a lot of users on the platform. I think one of the main things that Twitter does is they have these moments Uh, these Twitter moments, they go through and they say, okay, this hashtag was trending or this topic is being discussed. Twitter creates a little news story uh, using tweets from different users, which I think is a cool thing. But nine times out of 10, 
the news stories have a liberal slant. They only include viewpoints on one side of the on one side of the spectrum, and they're almost always pushing the liberal message on whatever it is. So I don't like the discussion of shadow banning because a lot of it comes down to, oh, I want to make sure that my message gets out. Oh, that evil Twitter, you know, like <laughs> it's essentially blaming Twitter for somebody's platform maybe not being as big as they want it to be. And I mean, it's it's something that sounds good to me because how how dare my tweets not get a million retweets and follows, you know, or and likes. I, I want Twitter to I want users to engage with me. But at the end of the day, uh, there are ways that Twitter I think is marginalizing some viewpoints and we can point directly to them. To go back to our main subject, um, <laughs> you know, regardless of the silencing on media that may or may not have been done around this film, I'm glad that it was able to be as much of a success as it has already. And I think it goes to prove also that maybe Planned Parenthood may not be as powerful or as much of a behemoth organization as it might want us to believe. I mean, I know that they have a lot of huge, huge billionaire backers, but, you know, I think that they're losing a little bit more of their grip. I think so. Uh, what we've seen in recent months with the Democrats pushing these very radical bills, uh, Americans are starting to wake up. And if you look at polling, you know, we had first the New York bill, which is really heinous. I mean, it even, not only did it allow abortion up until the beginning of labor, uh, if one doctor says that it's for the quote unquote health of the mother and health is very broadly defined. So an abortionist could claim, you know, her psychological health, her mental health, not only that, but it actually removed protections for the unborn, uh, for wanted unborn babies. So, like, one of the situations is there are laws across the country where if a pregnant woman is abused uh, and her baby dies and she has a miscarriage, then the person who abused her physically is liable for murder. And you can have a case where somebody abused a pregnant woman and the baby dies and they're charged for murder. What happened in New York was they explicitly got rid of those protections for babies. Babies were considered human in the womb, and if they were if they were killed in the womb by violence, it would be considered murder. Then they changed it, they, or at least it would be considered homicide. They changed it so they're no longer covered in homicide. There, there are these really, really extreme examples. And then, of course, you had Ralph Northam come out and say that... Uh, that he thinks it should be an open discussion whether or not the baby should be allowed to die if it was born alive in a planned abortion. So mm -hmm. these these positions are gaining steam on the left, and it's made Americans wake up to how radical they are on the issue. So the polling has shown that more Americans identify as pro-life than they did even just in January. Now we're back to a roughly 50-50 split, pro-life, pro-choice. But what's more interesting is that those labels don't really catch how Americans think about abortion. Most Americans oppose late-term abortion by high margins, like 80%. Democrats are pushing to have the third trimester abortion still be legal. And Planned Parenthood, you know, they're, they're doing everything they can to get these talking points out there because they're terrified with the Supreme Court going more conservative, that Roe v. Wade will be struck down. But in fighting to keep the status quo, a rather unjust status quo, in my opinion, they're showing just how radical they are and how much, how much they don't want protections for babies in almost any circumstance. You know, before this conversation with you, I was talking with some of my colleagues about how you can you know, you can go back and forth all day with someone about the logic of their argument regarding abortion, when life really begins and so on. But this is about the sanctity of life, how valuable we think it is. And those issues, realizing that it starts with the heart, it doesn't start in the head. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And that's one of the things that's very powerful about Unplanned 
one of the reasons why pro-choice activists have been able to push public opinion is because they show the pictures of the women. They say, oh, this, this woman can't afford to be a mother. She can't care for these babies. You know, we, we need to make sure that she can have an abortion so she's freed from these constraints. What Unplanned does and what the movie Gosnell did was it really shows that the mother's not the only equation. Abortion is not this safe, legal, and rare situation. It's, it can be excruciatingly painful for these women. And one of the things, you know, it, it, can, it is still linked with, with breast cancer. And this is an interesting point that the, the pro-abortion left is con- consistently pushed down and said is not true. But organizations outside the U.S. have said, why, yes, there is a connection. It really is horrifying when you think about the scale of human beings who are considered inhuman, whose lives are being thrown away, and all the women. I mean, there there have been studies that show that women feel pressured to have abortions by their partners, by their parents, by people who think that they wouldn't make good mothers. And we don't really know what these women would have chosen if they didn't have this pressure on them. Abortion does not end at the, at the end of the procedure. Women have had serious, serious pains and regrets. Even the woman, you know, the, the famous Roe in the Roe v. Wade case, she has come out and strongly for the pro-life position. She said she regrets her role in making abortion legal. And we see in cases like Abby Johnson's just how much someone's mind can be changed by seeing a baby on an ultrasound, by knowing that these are human beings, just as human as you and me. Tyler, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for listening today. Our team here at Acton wouldn't be able to produce Act In Line without you. And we would love to hear any feedback you have for this show. Help us make an even better podcast and email us at actinline at actin.org. Also, last but not least, don't forget to swing over to our website at actin.org slash line and subscribe to this podcast. We're available on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, or wherever you listen. 